I said the last couple of weeks, the new atheists, they insist that Christianity, like all religions, promotes beliefs that are irrational in the sense that there is no evidence to support them. Christianity is accused by them of getting people to believe fantasies, things they have absolutely no reason to believe are true. It's said that our beliefs are delusions, something comparable to Sam Harris believing that Nicole Kidman is in love with him despite their never having met. Now, I'm in the process of explaining why that is not true. I'm giving evidence and reasons to believe the existence of God and other aspects of the Christian faith. And last week I argued from evidence and logic and human experience that it's more reasonable to believe that a timeless, immaterial, spaceless, and immensely powerful personal being caused the universe to come into existence than to believe the alternative, which is that it came in, into existence uncaused from nothing. Now this morning, uh, I begin with the following proposition. It is more reasonable to believe there is an objective moral standard than to believe there is not. And it is more reasonable to believe then an objective moral standard cannot exist without God than to believe it can. So I want to begin this morning by, by focusing on that. Now, are moral standards objective or subjective? You see, when you say it's wrong to rape someone or to slit a baby's throat for fun, do you mean it's really and truly wrong, wrong no matter who says otherwise, objectively wrong, or do you mean it's merely contrary to some current human opinion, a social convention that's subject to change like clothing styles, subjectively wrong? If the Nazis had succeeded in conquering the world, and convincing the masses that slaughtering Jewish children was the moral equivalent of exterminating cockroaches, would killing them still be wrong? You see, is right and wrong whatever people say it is? Or does it exist independently of what people think? And the question is not whether atheists can be good people whether they can know moral standards and seek to live by them. Certainly they can. I mean, after all, they've been made in God's image and have a certain moral awareness and sensitivity uh, as a result of having been made in God's image. This is the law of the heart, to which Paul refers in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The question is not whether they can... Uh, no moral standards and seek to live by them. The question is whether atheists can have a rational basis for claiming that any conduct is objectively wrong. Wrong in a sense independent of human opinion. And they cannot. They cannot. After all, in their view, existence, all of existence, absolutely everything that exists is necessarily the product of blind, purposeless, natural forces. And how could such forces generate moral obligation? That's all that exists. Blind, purposeless, natural forces. How could those forces generate moral obligation? If blind, purposeless forces, for example, let's say wind or dripping water, carved marks in sandstone, in the shape, do not eat grapes. Let's just say the wind blew and it carved, you know, however things were, water dripped in a certain way, and carved sandstone in the shape, do not eat grapes. That would not create a moral obligation not to eat grapes. Anybody who appealed to those marks to condemn people eating grapes would be ridiculed 
and would be taught that humanity is not obligated to obey the fortuities of nature. Mindless phenomena like wind and rain cannot create moral obligation. Now, if the prohibition against slitting a baby's throat is the product of the same mindless forces as do not eat grapes, it cannot be any more binding. Any contrary sense that it's somehow more binding would be an illusion. And this is a fact that many atheist philosophers acknowledge. The renowned 20th century atheist philosopher Jean-Paul Chartres, he wrote in his book in 1957, Existentialism and Human Emotions, he says, it is very distressing that God does not exist because all possibility of finding values in a heaven of ideas disappears along with him. There can no longer be an a priori good since there's no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. Nowhere is it written that the good exists, that we must be honest, that we must not lie. Because the fact is, we are on a plane where there are only men. As Dostoevsky said, if God didn't exist, everything would be possible. And see, so you, you have atheist philosophers acknowledging this. The atheist philosopher Richard Taylor, who taught at Brown University, he taught at Columbia University, taught at the University of Rochester, he wrote in 1985... The concept of moral obligation is unintelligible apart from the idea of God. The words remain. You can still use the words, but their meaning is gone. They don't have any meaning. And though Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, like other atheists, he often appeals to moral absolutes. This is part of their inconsistency. Though Dawkins, like other atheists, often appeals to moral absolutes, in November of 1995, he wrote in Scientific American, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. In October of 2008, he said the following in his interview with Justin Brierley. Briarly said, but if we had evolved into a society in which rape was considered fine, would that mean rape is fine? Dawkins, I don't want to answer that question. It's enough for me to say that we live in a society where it's not considered fine. We live in a society where selfishness, where failure to pay debts, failure to reciprocate favors is regarded as scant. Ah, oh, that's the society in which we live. I'm very glad. That's a value judgment. I'm very glad that I live in such a society. Well, Briarly's not letting him get away with that. And he says, it is a value judgment. But when you make a value judgment, you need to set yourself outside of this evolutionary process to say the reason this is good is because it's good. And you don't have any way to stand on that statement. The value judgment itself could come from my evolutionary past, Dawkins says. So, it's therefore just as random as any product of evolution. Well, you could say that, uh, but it doesn't in any case. Nothing about it makes it more probable that there's anything supernatural. Okay, but ultimately, your belief that rape is wrong is as arbitrary as the fact that we evolve five fingers rather than six. You could say that, yes. Okay, so there's nothing objective about it. You see, it's just something, it's a fortuity of nature. Christian philosopher of religion, Gary Habermas, he wrote in 2008 in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, he said, in discussions of ethical theory, one will almost never find philosophical atheists who argue for absolute ethical standards. The chief reason they deny intrinsically grounded absolute ethical standards seems to be rather obvious. Objective moral standards cannot be expected to result from an atheistic evolutionary system grounded in the impersonal principles of the improbable but chance development of life. The atheist philosopher Michael Ruse, he wrote in an online article, UK Guardian, in March of 2010, Michael Ruse says, God is dead, so why should I be good? 
The answer is that there are no grounds whatsoever for being good. There is no celestial headmaster who's going to give you six or six billion, billion, billion of the best if you're bad. Morality is flim-flam. Now you know that morality is an illusion put in place by your genes to make you a social cooperator. What's to stop you from behaving like an ancient Roman grabbing Sabine women? Well, nothing in an objective sense. All right, that's right. That's what I'm telling you. These atheist philosophers, they recognize that. I mean, this isn't a secret. And that point wasn't lost on the infamous serial killer and cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer. He said in an interview with Stone Phillips for Dateline in 2004, here's what Jeffrey Dahmer said. I always believe the theory of evolution as truth that we all just came from slime. If a person doesn't think there's a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? I mean, Dahmer's out killing people by the truckload and eating them. He said, what, what, what difference does it make? If it's all just mindless junk bubbling up, who cares? That's no different than, you know, blinking or anything else. He understood that. You see, and this is where the atheists are. The atheist Joel Marx, who's professor emeritus of philosophy at the University of New Haven, he wrote in 2010 in an article in Philosophy Now, here's what this philosophy professor says, I've given up morality altogether. This philosopher has long been laboring under an unexamined assumption, namely, that there is such a thing as right and wrong. I now believe there isn't. How I arrived at this conclusion is the subject of a book I've written. The long and short of it is that I became convinced that atheism implies amorality. And since I am an atheist, I must therefore embrace amorality. I experienced my shocking epiphany that the religious fundamentalists are correct. Without God, there is no morality. But they are incorrect, I still believe, about there being a God. Hence, I believe there's no morality. Even though words like sinful and evil come naturally to the tongue as a description of, say, child molesting, they do not describe any actual properties of anything. There are no literal sins in the world because there is no literal God. And hence, the whole religious superstructure that would include such categories as sin and evil just so, I now maintain, nothing is literally right or wrong because there is no morality, capital M. Now, it's interesting, by the way, I don't know if you noticed here, but, but even here, the atheist can't live consistently with the demands of his philosophy. You see that Dr. Marx there said, since I'm an atheist, I must, therefore, embrace a morality. Must? You must embrace amorality, as in, I am ethically obligated to, be, to live consistently with my philosophy, but there's no morality. What do you mean I must? I'm, you know, I have to be true to something. What are you talking about? There is no truth. Just live differently. Live inconsistently. No, no, no. I must be true. You see, this creeps in and exposes them all the time. But it's like crazy. You try to get them to see it, and they just can't see it. I'm thinking this guy's a philosophy professor. How, why did it take him to 2010 to see this? Took him till 2010. In April of 2013, in a de debate with Frank Turek, David Sil Silverman, who's president of American Atheist, he made the following statements. There's no such thing as objective morality. All morality is relative. There is no objective moral standard. Now, he also said that his preferring a culture that cares for children over one that eats them and his condemnation of Nazi atrocities was just, quote, an opinion, end quote. And he agreed that people, quote, have every right to do, end quote, 
what in his opinion is wrong. And yet he insisted on labeling what they did as immoral. You see, moral relativism and confused thinking is where his atheist philosophy has driven him. Just, a, just 12 days ago, March 3rd, 2013, the British atheist philosopher John Gray, he wrote in The Guardian, United Kingdom, he said, to be sure, evangelical unbelievers, evangelical unbelievers adamantly deny that liberalism and all the liberalism, the values that they cherish, that liberalism needs any support from theism. A liberal morality that applies to all human beings can be formulated without any mention of religion. Or so we're continually being told. The trouble is that it's hard to make any sense of the idea of a universal morality, an objective morality, a morality that does not depend on people, is not made up by people, not created by people, but exists independently of people. He says, the trouble is it's hard to make any sense of the idea of a universal morality without invoking an understanding of what it is to be human that has been borrowed from theism. He says, well, anyone who wants their values secured by something beyond the capricious human world had better join an old-fashioned religion. If you set aside any view of humankind that's borrowed from monotheism, you have to deal with human beings as you find them with their perpetually warring values. You get rid of God, and there is no objective morality, so it's just us fighting. Anything can be right, anything can be wrong. There is no true right and wrong. And I think, see, this flows out. Now, we know intuitively, we know intuitively, we know in our hearts that there is an objective morality, that there are moral facts, not just moral opinions. We know, for example, that it's not a matter of personal opinion whether raping someone or slitting a baby's throat for fun is wrong. It's wrong, and if somebody doesn't recognize that, it means they're not functioning properly. That person's a sociopath, not a philosopher. You see, he's a sociopath, as even Michael Ruse acknowledged in his 1982 book, Darwinism Defended, he said, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. There are moral facts, not just moral opinions, and it's the objective nature of morality. It is the fact that there is a morality that isn't simply human opinion, that there is a morality that transcends humanity. It is the fact there's an objective morality that explains the outrage that we feel over something like child molestation. You see, if I can't stand the taste of sushi and somebody else eats sushi, I don't get indignant. You see, I don't get morally outraged over that because it's a subjective matter. It's a matter of opinion. It's completely different if they rape a child. If somebody rapes a child, he comes and says, well, you know, I just think it's okay. I said, well, you know, hey, you know, I like, you like sushi, I don't. You like raping children, I don't. You like slitting babies' throats, I don't. It's not like that. It is the objective nature of the morality that explains the revulsion, the umbrage, the indignation, the righteous anger that comes when somebody acts this way. See, their differing opinion on something like that doesn't exempt them from the moral standard because that moral standard is independent of human opinion. Indeed, it's the objectiveness of morality. The fact morality is not made up by human beings, is not determined by human vote, that allows us to judge some human laws as unjust and immoral. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, he said, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. 
An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Well, people create it, right? And there is something over it by which we can judge it. You see? It's not just whatever we wind up making up. It's not up to us. And because atheism is incompatible with the existence of objective morality, our moral sense, this idea in this sense, we know that there's something wrong with that. That's not just a matter of opinion, but there are moral facts. And that is this... So the, the fact that atheism is inconsistent with the existence of objective morality, our moral sense bears witness to the falsity of atheism. It is telling us, our sense and understanding intuitively, that there is more to the wrongness of slitting a baby's throat for fun than the fact somebody just doesn't like it. There's something bigger than that. That sense that we have is testifying to the falsity of atheism. It's telling us that atheism is not true. You see, it's telling us that. And you see this tension in somebody like Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was probably the most famous atheist philosopher of the 20th century. So he's no piker, okay? And here's what Russell said. I cannot see how to refute the arguments for the subjectivity of ethical values. But I find myself incapable of believing that all that is wrong with wanton cruelty is that I don't like it. You see, I, he says, I, I cannot get around the truth and the argument and the fact that if there is no God, there is no objective morality. All I'm left with is I don't like it. You may like it. I don't like it. You like sushi. I don't like sushi. But he says, I hate it. I can't, I can't believe that. Well, then why don't you believe in God? That's telling you that your view is off. That's witnessing to you that you're... He says, it's all this wrong way. He says, I find myself incapable of believing it. I can't get around the arguments. But man, I find myself incapable. All right, that's a clue unto your household. <laughs> you see, that's a clue unto your household that something has happened and you've made a mistake. Now it's almost funny, at least to me, watching atheists express moral indignation and outrage over certain conduct, especially when they think they can blame it on religion. In his May 2007 debate with Christopher Hitchens in Christianity Today, the Christian theist, Douglas Wilson, he kept pressing Hitchens to provide a rational basis for labeling any conduct good or bad. If existence consists solely of matter acting according to various laws of nature, then it's meaningless to speak of any conduct as either good or bad. It simply is. You know, we, we might as well say it's good for a flower to be yellow, but bad for it to be red. You see, so he keeps pressing him, what is the rational basis given your atheistic worldview of being able to make moral judgments? And the best that Hitchens could muster in his answer to Wilson's persistent inquiry, his pressing of him was to say, quote, our morality evolved, end quote. Well, that's a fairly common line. You saw it in Dawkins. It's a fairly common line taken by atheists who want to keep their atheism, but also feel justified in their moral condemnation of other people. And I think Wilson did a beautiful job of exposing the fatal defect in that claim. It's a little bit lengthy, four slides, stick with me, but listen to what he says, what uh, Wilson says in response to this. He said, on the, on the question of morality, this is, he's writing, to, he's, he's in a, a debate with Christopher Hitchens. Okay, one of the new atheists died in December of 2011. He says, on the question of morality, you again attempt an answer. Quote, he's quoting Hitchens now. My answer is the same as it was all along. Our morality evolved, end quote. There are two points to be made about this reply. The first concerns evolved morality and the future. And is a variation on my previous questions. If our morality evolved then that means our morality changes. 
If morality, if, if evolution isn't done yet, and why should it be, then that means our morality is involved in this ongoing flux as well. And that means that everything we consider to be, quote, moral is really up for grabs. Our quote, no, he's quoting Hitchens, I think, here. He says, our, quote, vague yet grand conception of human rights, end quote, might flat disappear, just like our gills did. He says, our current morals are therefore just a way station on the road. No sense getting really attached to them, right? When I'm traveling, I don't get attached to motel rooms. I don't weep when I have to part from them. So in the future, after every ferocious moral denunciation you choose to offer your reading public, you really need to add something like, but this is just a provisional judgment. Our perspective may evolve to an entirely different one some years hence. Or, provisional opinions only. Morality changes over time. Pumcot for short. It would look like this. The Reverend Snoutworthy is an odious little toad, not to mention a waste of skin, and his proposal that we prosecute the Brazier editors of the Sears catalog on pornography and racketeering charges is an outrage against civilized humanity, but... Pumcot. See, provisional opinion only, morality changes over time. He needs that little footnote to all of these denunciations. This relates to the second point which concerns evolved morality and the past. When dealing with people whose moral judgments have differed from yours, do you regard them as immoral or as less evolved? The rhetoric of your book, your tone in these exchanges, and your recent dancing on the grave of the late Jerry Falwell would all seem to indicate the former. In your choice of words, the people you denounce are to be blamed. The word fulminations comes to mind. You write like a witty but acerbic 10th century archbishop with a, bad, with a bad case of the gout. But this is truly an odd thing to do if morality is a simple derivative of evolution. Are you filled with fierce indignation that the koala bear hasn't evolved ears that stick flat to the side of his head like they're supposed to? Are you wroth over the fact clams don't have legs yet? When you notice that the bears at the zoo continue to suck on their paws, do you stop to remonstrate with them? You see, this to me just shows, this is just junk as far as I'm concerned. This idea we're saying, we're talking about the objective nature of morality. Objective or so, well, my morality, well, it's just another way of saying it's subjective. It's just moving along. It's not really wrong. And just like Dawkins, well, yeah, we could have been, a rape could have been right. Slitting a baby's throat could have been right. It's just all the fortuities of nature, you see. It's not really wrong. It's just that we've kind of moved along that we currently think it's wrong. And so that's the whole point. Why don't you just then say that when I say, is there an objective morality? Why don't you just say no? Why do you try to lead me through all this junk where you can just confuse? Oh, no, no. Oh, don't, you know, don't listen to those people. Uh, you don't want to do that. You know, what do they know? They're religious. They're morons. You see? Ah. <laughs> but on we go. Now, atheists, including some of the new atheists, they sometimes they try to undermine the claim that God is the necessary foundation of morality by raising what's known as the euthyphro dilemma. You may have run across that when you talk, talk in this world you won't talk long and somebody will bring this up. They try to get around this idea that God is the necessary foundation of morality by raising this. This is, it, is it, it goes back a while, but the new atheists have also raised this, at least two of them that I know of. Now, the name comes from a question that was asked by Socrates in Plato's early 4th century B.C. work titled Euthyphro, and the gist of that question the essence of that question is, do the gods will something because it is good, or is something good because the gods will it? Now, Euthyphro was a polytheist, and their gods were you know, merely somewhat more powerful and knowledgeable than humans, but they were still flawed. 
But anyway, on the question here, you see this is presented, it's seen as a dilemma because if the gods will something because it's good, then the good is independent of and outside of the gods. It's something that exists outside and above them. If, on the other hand, the good is whatever the gods will, if that's the thing that makes it good, well, that seems to be an example then of might makes right. They could have declared something different, see, to be good, something totally different. So it makes good and evil arbitrary. You see, so that's, that's proposed, that's set forth as the dilemma. Well, the classic response when this euthyphro dilemma is pressed on Christians or on any who believe in the God of Scripture is that it's a false dilemma. You see, it's a false dilemma. There is, in fact, a third alternative. It is not the case that God wills something because it is good, nor is it the case that something is good because God wills it. Rather, God wills something because He is good. You see, He wills something because He is good. In other words, it's God's own nature that determines what is good. He is by nature, he is in essence, compassionate, just, fair, kind, loving, and on and on. And because he is good, his commandments to us necessarily reflect his good, righteous, pure, holy nature. His commandments and our moral duties are rooted in his essence. They are neither arbitrary nor nor are they grounded in anything that is external to him. You see, so it's really a false dilemma, but they'll raise it, and I just wanted you to be aware of it. Being made in God's image, as we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, and having an innate moral sense, as we see the Paul's reference to the law of the heart in Romans 2, 14 and 15, we are to some extent, you see, tuned in to what is moral and right. This God who is goodness he has he he commands things because he is good and we are made in his image and we are to some extent tuned into that by virtue of the law of the heart by virtue of being made in his image but being fallen creatures you see our our sense in that regard is fallible right our sense in that regard is fallible that's why paul speaks to our consciences how they can be seared he says in titus chapter 2 verse 4 so we have to inform our conscience by studying the revelation of God. We can't simply always say, well, I'm tuned in. No, we're fallen. You see, so we have, to, we have to sharpen that and consult and read and study the revelation of God in that regard. So let me conclude this part by repeating this. I say it is more reasonable to believe. These guys say, you know, you don't, you don't have any evidence, you don't think, you don't have any reason, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it is more reasonable to believe there is an objective moral standard than to believe slit in a baby's toast, ba baby's throat's not like, you know, like, is, is like, you know, I don't like peanut butter toast. Okay, it's more reasonable to believe there is an objective moral standard that says, no, that's objectively wrong. I don't care if everybody comes to think it's like peanut butter toast. It remains wrong. All right. It's more reasonable to believe there's an objective moral standard than to believe there is not. And it is more reasonable to believe that an objective moral standard cannot exist without God than to believe it can. Okay, so I, it seems to me I'm saying, well, you guys are sitting here saying that you just are crazy people. You're just making stuff up and it's like these complete delusions. And I said, well, now listen, do you not read anything? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's... The, the, these things aren't secret. You can go find these things out. Now, the second thing I want to talk about, and this I'm going to run out of time, is it's more reasonable. Let me put this up. This is the free will argument for God. It's more reasonable to believe that free will exists than to believe it does not. And it's more reasonable to believe that free will cannot exist without God than to believe it can. See, humans are able to think and act in a genuinely 
non-determined manner. We can choose to write a letter, eat an apple, sing a song, I can do this, or not. You see, we can choose to do these things. Now, if there is no God, then the universe and everything in it is a result of physical laws, whether they be gravitational, electromagnetic, chemical, mechanical, thermodynamic, radiation, it doesn't matter. Everything is the product, is the result of physical laws acting on matter and energy over time, which is an exclusively deterministic process. In other words, things occur solely because the laws of nature make them occur. It's like a big machine. Everything, you know, this, this happens, this happens, this happens, because these laws, various laws, acting on matter and energy over time, dictate how matter and energy is to operate. And then the question is how this strictly deterministic process gave rise to beings who act in a non-determined manner. How did this strictly mechanical process of various laws acting on matter and energy over time, dictating how they respond and move and do and are, how did that deterministic process give rise to creatures that can act in a non-determined manner? What evidence is there that physical laws can create free will? That they can create beings which beings that act in a way not determined by those laws. Well, that's quite a problem, it seems to me. Okay, if I've got a mechanistic view, an atheistic view, how do I get to this free will? Oh, a law is just great. No, no, I'm not letting you get away with that. How are laws creating something that acts outside of those laws? That's what I want to know. And, and there are many atheists that recognize this problem. They see that, hmm. I don't like this. They recognize this is difficult. So what they do is they argue that free will is an illusion. You see? No, no, no. I, I see what you're saying. No, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard for me to imagine how a deterministic process can, can create beings that can act in a non-determined manner. Physical laws can somehow create something that's exempt from physical laws. But here's the problem. Your free will is an illusion. You don't really have free will. So what you're posing to me is junk. You're telling me you got free will, which would be a problem, but I'm telling you your free will is an illusion. You don't really have it. You see, human choices and conduct are in fact determined by physical laws, the effects of which just happen to be too complicated, too complex for us to trace out. But trust me, you're just a sophisticated robot. You are in fact, in, in, in words of Sam Harris, you're a biochemical puppet. You're a meat robot. So I know, I know you don't think that. And, you know, it's, just, it's because the stuff is really complicated and hard to trace out. But you are a fully determined biochemical puppet. And you think, now nah, nobody really thinks that. Au contraire. <laughs> Au contraire. In the words of the prominent atheist philosopher from the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, I mentioned a while ago, he says, man's hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations, meaning arrangements, of atoms. His loves and his beliefs, his hopes and his fears are what? You see? Accidental arrangement of atoms, and there you have them. They just come out like that. In his 1994 book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul, Francis Crick, who's the co-discoverer of DNA, Crick says, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Dawkins wrote in 1995 in his book, River Out of Eden, he says, DNA neither cares nor knows 
DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Will Provine, who's an atheist historian of science at Cornell University, the abstract of his comments at the second annual Darwin Day celebration at the University of Tennessee in February of 1998 begins with this. Naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Charles Darwin understood perfectly. One, no gods worth having exist. Two, no life after death exists. Three, no ultimate foundation for ethics exists. Four, no ultimate meaning in life exists. And five, human free will is non-existent. Jerry Coyne, who's the University of, of Chicago biologist, he wrote in an online article in 2012, he said, perhaps you've chosen to read this essay. He's one of the new atheists, by the way, kind of a second tier new atheist guy. Perhaps you've chosen to read this essay after scanning other articles on this website. Or if you're in a hotel, maybe you've decided what to order for breakfast or what clothes you'll wear today. You haven't. You may feel like you've made, those cho made choices, but in reality, your decision to read this piece and whether to have eggs or pancakes was determined long before you were aware of it, perhaps even before you woke up today. And your, quote, will had no part in that decision. So it is with all of our other choices. Not one of them results from a free and conscious decision on our part. There is no freedom of choice, no free will. And those New Year's resolutions you made, you had no choice about making them. And you'll have no choice about whether you keep them. That sounds good, doesn't it? Okay. True free will, then, would require us to somehow step outside of our brain structure. You see the meat robot? He says the meat robot can't step outside. It's just a naturalistic philosophy that denies any spiritual element. True free will, then, would require us to somehow step outside of our brain's structure and modify how it works. Science hasn't shown any way we can do this. Because we are simply constructs of our brain. We can't impose a nebulous, quote, will on the inputs to our brain that can affect its output of decisions and actions any more than a program computer can somehow reach inside itself and change its program. The ineluctable scientific conclusion is that although we feel that we're characters in the play of our lives, rewriting our parts as we go along, in reality... We're puppets performing scripted parts written by the laws of physics. Now, I know when I told you this, you're thinking, no, nobody really believes that. Au contraire, they do. They believe this. Why? Because it is a derivative of their philosophy that there is no God. All that exists is matter and law over time. So what else are you going to do? You're either going to say that matter and law over time creates a spiritual thing you see, that is free of the dictates of law working on matter and energy over time, or you deny that there is a free will. And so they're opting for this. They're taking root two. Sam Harris in his 2012 book, Free Will. Sam Harris says, free will is an illusion. Our wills are simply not of our own making. Thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we're unaware and over which we have no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. Then he says later in that same book, you will do whatever it is you do and it is meaningless to assert that you could have done otherwise. Referring to Harris's book, Free Will, Victor Stenger, who's one of the new atheists, Victor Stenger writes in 2012, we don't exist as immaterial. That's what really bugs them, you see. The idea of a spirit, immaterial, they don't like it. That's why they're called naturalists, you see. Uh, we, don't exist, we don't exist as immaterial conscious controllers, but are instead entirely physical beings whose decisions and behaviors are the fully caused products of the brain and body. Now, I heard that bell. But let me tell you that this naturally leads to the claim, as you can see, right? This leads to the claim that humans are not responsible for their actions, right? I mean, being in essence sophisticated robots, so I have no, what, what do you want me to do, man? 
I couldn't do anything else. Why? I got chemicals. I'm, you know, hey, you know, I'm just like a sophisticated robot. I know you really, I, it looks to you like I got will. It looks to you like I can choose things, but I really can't. So you can see how inevitably that has what? That has consequences on personal responsibility. Now, next week, Lord willing, I'll show you some quotes of how this plays out in the second tier. You see that one of the consequences, we deny free will, well, then what happens? And you'll have some very, uh, you'll be going, do they really think that? And again, the answer will be yes, they really do. Okay, thanks for coming.